Arabian Business Magazine made a list of the world's most powerful Arabs. And the lady who's going to come to the stage next is on that list. Her name is Noor Sweet. Please welcome her. So, in common with uh, everybody else we've had in this, this rapid-fire sequence, tell me a bit about uh, your journey and what it is that you do, Noor. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for embarrassing me. Um, <laughs> the list did come out that yesterday, so your bird, was, your bird was very quick. Um, so, you know, we, I'm based in Dubai. My journey as a global citizen, as many of you are, mm. kind of um, private sector, public sector, CIO, public company officer, so the gamut. Um, now I run a VC firm. So we invest across Middle East and Africa. Um, the region is one and a half billion people. Half of us are under 30. I said this yesterday and someone seemed very surprised. They didn't believe me, they had to Google it. Um, but yeah, so it's the part of the world where there's very little venture, a lot of young people, a lot of talent, um, and we run a mission-driven venture capital firm. So some of the areas that you invest in, we've, we've been talking about food prior to this. That's, well, maybe one of the things that you do, but you do other stuff too. We do, we do food. We take a look at really, you know, very basic human needs is what we do for half the time. And then globally scalable companies are what we do the other half of the time. With food, um, you know, we've seen incredible companies come out of the region uh, that focus on food security, feeding people, and that have managed to scale from the region into the world, into Arizona, Wisconsin. But we address things very differently in our part of the world. So when we think about food and sustainability and feeding people, we can't afford to do it the same way that maybe it's done in Europe and the US. And from necessity comes creation. So for example, one of our companies, Red Sea Farms, has the patent and invented a way that you can use 95% less energy for the purpose of desalinating water for vertical farming. And that technology is now being exported globally. Mm -hmm. But that's just really important in a part of the world where energy is expensive, yeah. unpredictable. So you take a look and you have plenty of salt water. Right? So you end up in a position where you think, is there a better way to do this? So when we think about food sustainability or anything at large, we think about this from a grassroots level. It's grounds up. So it's you don't have um, you know, enough doctors. Well, you're not going to graduate enough doctors for the region. So when we take a look at healthcare, we have 0.2 doctors per 1,000 people in Africa, and we have one per 1,000 in MENA. Europe's at four and a half. So you're never going to get there. So when we think about it, we think about leapfrogging. We didn't fix the gap of financial inclusion by building banks. We're not going to fix the gap of healthcare inclusion by building hospitals. How can you do that? And therefore, you have then technologies that are built that really can stream doctors into places. So we invested in a company two years ago where a female surgeon um, who was working on cleft palates was spending way too much time traveling and not enough time operating. So it literally started FaceTiming with her friends who were other surgeons saying, well, I can guide you through this surgery virtually if you guide me through that one. Probably not a great practice. But where that ended up now is it's an augmented reality platform that streams virtual surgeons, special surgeons, anywhere in the world into any OR to work with the physical surgeon that's there. That company has now done 14,000 surgeries, of which over half are in the US, are in 600 American hospitals, backed by Teladoc, Maverick, F Prime. So you have leading global investors. But just less than two years ago, this was a $30 million company that had done less than 200 surgeries in Beirut with a bunch of engineers that are trying to solve the problem of how can people access healthcare? So when we take a look at investing in our part of the world, there are globally scalable companies that are leapfrogging legacy, but that are just focused on how can I help people? How can I feed people? Right? How can we give access to education? We have 150 million out of school children. That's half the world out of school. So when we think about ed tech, it's really for the masses. So that's what we do. You also. Uh mentioned before when we spoke um, about a system whereby people going to hospital records, hospital records. Yes, EMRs. 
Yeah. So <laughs> electronic medical records. Oh, yeah. And actually, funny enough, the founder was here yesterday. I don't know if Gok is still here oh, today. Okay. So w this is one of the first companies we backed in digital health. And you take a look in, um, it's a Lagos-based company in Nigeria that has now expanded into four other countries, including Qatar and the UAE, and has a system that's offline first. And why does that win? Why does that win in a part of the world where less than 30% of hospital visits are documented? Right. Well, the reason that that's the case is because there's not really any internet, let alone electricity, that you can depend on. So if you're in a part of the world where these things are non-dependable, and most medical record systems depend on electricity and internet, mm. then you're not going to document. So you can imagine, you know, in an undereducated population, if someone's sick, goes into the hospital, gets treatment, leaves, feels worse the next day, and goes back in, no one recalls seeing him. No one has any record that they, he or she was there. And so these two gentlemen came back um, and built a system to fix this. And what offline first means is you're not always connected, you don't need the internet, you don't need electricity, and you can start documenting things. You can integrate with the regulator, you can integrate with the patient, and then as typical founders in our part of the world, they found so many pain points for the patient along the journey that now they offer the financial inclusion side of this for the hospital, for the provider, for the patient. And this company has grown massively. We now have you know, potential clients for them in Europe that are saying this is better than Epic, which is the typical one that was built 30, 40 years ago that is very, very clunky. So all of these systems that are being built um, with no legacy in our part of the world, the founders, it's not... It's not really that they're trying to think outside the box. For them, there is no box. So it's, here's a problem <laughs> we're solving for hundreds of millions. Here's technology. How do we do it? There's nothing in our way. And those are the companies that we're looking at. Back but I, it's very stimulating, though, because I think having to readjust a, a legacy company, and I speak as somebody who works for one, the BBC is, is, has all of these problems in a changing media age that it did things in a certain way. Banks have these problems, airlines have these problems. This is a very exciting way of working where you're building something, as you say, there is no box. It is. I think our founders find it very stimulating. Um, stressful, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> stressful, stressful is another way to see it. And the challenges become is that you need to build everything, right? So you go out to fix this problem and then realize there's no box, there's also no infrastructure. Yes. So then you need to fix the next problem and the next. And so you end up having to fix four problems before you can start to tackle the problem that you really want to solve, um, which is great for the ecosystem. At this point in time, we've backed 54 founders. So we've been doing this for about four years. Um, and what I will say, you know, our first fund was a 2018 vintage. We started at about the same time as Ellie and um, a $50 million fund for the region. And everyone thought, where are you going to deploy that? How are you going to make money? So our part of the world is massively underfunded in venture. The entire MENA ecosystem last year did about $2.5 billion in venture. And then Sub-Saharan Africa did about another $2 billion. So that's about one Series D round, or 2021 D round, in, in the Bay Area. Um, that's one deal. Here you have 400 deals. All the markets is $2.5 billion. So when we started four years ago saying we're going to put $50 million to work and about 20 companies, um, people said, that's really thoughtful of you. That's very kind of you. And we said, we want to back mission-driven founders. And so is it philanthropy? And we had this question. We said, no, we're going to really work on this venture meets impact. So mission-driven venture. And that fund has performed in the top decile by pitch book rankings. So we've returned 70% of the capital in two years. It's sitting at a three TVPI. But it's also financially included 27 million people given 4 million access to healthcare, half a million access to education, created 7,300 jobs in a part of the world where your youth unemployment's about 40% mm. on a good day. Um, so you're really thinking about, we're creating the financial returns, we're also able to really touch people's lives in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Earlier today, we were talking about metrics, how people are measuring success and how that's changed. How do you measure success? Um, in so many different ways. Yes. So I think if we don't create the financial returns, then we can't raise the next fund and we can't invest in more companies that change people's lives. Right. So the first, most fundamentally, we have to create financial returns. So our second fund was 115 million that we've been able to deploy really well and, and have great returns on that as well. But that was only possible because we did so well with the first fund. So when you think about that, you're like, if you really want to deploy increasing amounts of capital um, to affect lives, then you have to create those returns. 
Then we think about how do we measure success. So we measure it based on the five SDGs that we personally align with, which we believe are like the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. So it's really about food, it's about um, education, it's about healthcare, it's about financial inclusion. We're not trying to solve kind of, can I get my groceries in 10 minutes instead of 20? Um, it's really about, can you feed more people? So that's how we think about investing. Um, we don't in any way, shape, or form take impact metrics into our decision-making process on investing. That's pure financial. How we do it is we believe if we back mission-driven founders, then that'll make the difference. So if a founder comes in and talks about a unicorn or a billion-dollar company or an exit in the first half hour of a meeting, they're probably doing this because they want only the financial returns, whereas if the founder comes in and talks about the problem they're solving and how it impacts lives and how it changes people's lives, then that's probably a founder that you really want to help solve that problem and in the meantime, create a business model that generates the returns you need. Fascinating. Any questions quickly? I think we're running out of time very fast, aren't we? Yeah. How, what sort of time scale would you invest this is my naivety here. What sort of time scale are we talking about? Well, it's not naivety. I think it's, it's a real question, right? So the, the biggest question we often get is not just the time scale, but also the exits. Yes. So I think in our part of the world, people say, oh, everyone puts money in, but no one manages to exit. <laughs> so we've managed to prove that that's not true. We've had four great exits. Um, and in some of them, you know, you put three million, a year later it's worth 35 million, it stops making sense and so you exit. And others, we've really helped the company get to the metrics that they wanted on the social side. So it's a blend. Um, as a typical VC fund, we invest on a seven to 10 year horizon. But, you know, cycles turn, things change. Um, at this point in time, we have a few more exits happening this year and those are all three or four year periods where you've created the returns um, that you want to generate. So we're creating an asset class in a part of the world that is typically underinvested. We have a lot to prove. The exits are part of it. The multiples are another part. The impact is a third part. Um, but what we really found is, is at this point in time, people are excited about the population, the demographics, the growth, um, and the technologies coming out of this part of the world. And you're not, you're not going to um, hang up your whatever it is, any time soon. There seems to be a wealth of opportunity out there. There is, and we've had increasing numbers of international investors start to come in. So three years ago, mm. there was maybe one or two international investors investing in our part of the world. Now you have General Atlantic, you have Tiger Global, which you know, is notorious these days, but they've done a lot. Um, you've had General Catalyst come in, you've had Sequoia do many of our follow-ons. So you have a lot of the international investors starting to identify this place as one and a half billion people, half of them are under 30, and they're going to be consumers, they're going to be producers, they're going to need to buy things, and they are going to need services and technology. Thank you.